And here we are for part two, but this time in person. Mr. Miller, how you doing, my friend? What's going on? Yeah, not too bad, mate. How's it going? Yeah, exciting time. So, good chat to you beforehand about loads of different things. And yeah. one thing you're mainly over for here anyway is for the seminar tomorrow at Adams. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what's going to be spoken about tomorrow? Um, so, I decided to create like a seminar based on like fight camp nutrition because I think that's like an area where people, that's like the bread and butter where people don't know the ins and outs. So, I thought I'd create, create a seminar break the stuff down, the science behind it. You know, people know to cut carbs out, but they don't know why to cut carbs out. Same with like five or salt. So I thought, yeah, um, create a seminar and then do a bit of a tour and yeah, see what the feedback is. So the way you built the sort of seminar model, yeah. were they the same things you get from people who you already you work with? Is it just general things you felt were missing in the sport? How did you build this model? Um, it was just basically very similar to you know, how I'd, how I'd set up a fight camp nutrition plan with with a client, but in a bit of a broader sense, so mm -hmm. a rough guideline to follow, you know, what you should look for on fight week, the, the strategies, the, you know, heat, heat acclimation, the water cut, sort of, sort of guidelines to follow. So, you know, so someone could go from that seminar and go, okay, I have a little bit mm -hmm. of an idea how to go about it now. You know, I'm not going in blind. And you've got, you've got a bit of a reference point to go from. Because um, I think that's like, the main, the main problem is people don't know what to do when they get they get a fight and they just wing it. I'll, I'll just cut the calories back, but they don't know what why why they do it. And that's something we were speaking about as well, and yeah. in quite a bit more detail because the nature of what you learn just from a layman is, yeah. you know, calories in, calories out. Yeah. When you get to a certain level, you're losing quite a lot of weight and trying to do it purely on your true weight versus the superficial weight of water weight being yeah. manipulated. It's a very different thing as a science in itself. Oh yeah, hundred percent because. That's a big thing that you have with with fighters, the the distinct the distinction between um, chronic weight loss and acute weight loss. So you know, chronic weight loss is loss of, like body fat, mm -hmm. tissue over the number of weeks, and then the acute phase is the you know the final week where it's manipulating your body stores, the carbohydrates, the fiber, the salt. So I think that's a big thing where you, you probably know yourself. You're about, oh, finish a hard training session. Oh, I'm I'm you know. I was 72 before training, now I'm 70. Like, I'm, I'm on track, it's like, well, that's just, that's just water weight. It's not like, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So I think it's educating people. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm delving into in the talk is, is educating them, like, what to look for. Like, yeah, you will lose X amount during training, but that's not body tissue. So, mm -hmm. like, things to look out for from that. Also, like, sustainable amounts as well. Because, again, if you lost that, say, on the, I don't know, the Monday evening, and yeah. a little bit more on the Tuesday, but you not training over the weekend, so yeah. all the water weight you've lost during the week, you'll then balloon back up and yeah. my weight's fluctuating, yeah. overweight, this, that, and the other, and it creates that stress as well. And that, yeah, as I said, the stress, like, the guys were old me, I was, like, I have a lot of guys who are very numbers focused, and some that just, you educate them to the point where, like, they know that that's going to change with it. Some guys, like, I was this weight this day, and now I'm up to this, and all that, and that's like, it, it's going to fluctuate, you need to, like, just, like, I say chill out, but like you need yeah. to accept that 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 that's what's going to happen with certain foods that you eat. But yeah, that the the dis distinguishing between the the chronic and the acute, I think that's one of the main things that I, like I want to talk about in 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 the seminars. What's the usual like rabbit hole people go down, or sort of what's the usual like weight cutting myth you seem to see people following who haven't got the prior experience? Um. I think, in, in a weird way, anyone anyone can cut weight. Anyone could lose weight if they, if they like, but it's losing weight in the right way. And I think the the biggest ones is just just completely like no carb, like no carbs. That's it. Just cut carbs out straight away. Okay, like so. Two weeks into camp, how do you feel? I feel like shit. It's like that, that explains it. Like, it, and it's probably mainly like. Probably the, the, the carbohydrates, the the dehydration phase is probably one of the biggest like bits of confusion with fighters where like, oh, should I start? I had an example yesterday, a guy I'm working with, his coach recommended he starts going to the sauna on a Monday and he's weighing in on the Saturday just to lose weight. Like, so it's like, mm. there's, a, there's, there's a lot of confusion around and then you, like, guys will, search forums on the internet how did you do it and like oh yeah. big john oh yeah i lost i lost seven kilos in a week i've been you know fighting for 
30 years white collar, yeah, mm. yeah, he lost the weight. Great, as I said, and most people can do that if they don't eat. But are, are they doing it the right way and they're gonna be op- perform optimally when it comes to fights? Probably not. I think there's so much in that where it gets misconstrued and sort of lost in translation. Yeah. Say like losing X amount of kilos, but say build wise, say if you're a flyweight losing three or four kilos in a weight cut, yeah. That could be a lot. I say percentage wise, oh, yeah. on a smaller frame, it could yeah. be devastating. Whereas if you're heavyweight, you don't even notice it. Yeah, but that, and, and that's the when I have I have sort of guidelines to go on, like a like red green red amber green zones where like right where we're going to shift fight week is the red zone where we, where we're looking at because I said different weight classes, you know, losing losing five kilos for a welterweight in fight week is. Yeah. Cruisy, but losing five kilos for fly weight on fight week is a little bit. <laughs> it's getting close to ten percent your body weight, which is it was just a lot. But then that's like the you know going into the conversation of where you know you you fueled up opt- optimally to fight week, and then you can manipulate them body stores where you can cut the carbs, you can cut the fiber, you can do a water, and you can lose that weight. But mm. what majority, not majority, but what a lot of people do is they cut the carbs off straight away. The you hardly drink any water. So when it comes to fight week, there's two methods where you can't manipulate. You've like, you've got nothing in the tank anyway to lose, and then that's when you go into the the the, the dehydration methods. You're losing bigger, you're doing bigger water cuts, and and it's surprising as well because like, even guys in like the top level, like the UFC, are, are doing stuff like this, and I, it's it's crazy to think mm. that that it's still it's still like it's still a thing at the top top level. One thing I don't understand, at least from different sort of stages of people wherever they're at, yeah. is why are carbs so demonised, do you reckon? Why is that the first thing to go? I think it's because of the it's because of the, the body weight, the water association with the carbohydrates. Mm. So one gram of carbs binds to three grams of water. So if you're having a lot of carbs, you're naturally going to be bigger because you've got yeah. that water weight. So I think that's why it's demonised, because you think, oh, like with the same the, the ketogenic diets where people adopt the ketogenic diet and they go, oh yeah, well I lost lost six pounds in a week. Yeah, because you were eating like 500 grams of carbs daily the week before, you're obviously gonna lose weight. So I think it's that and like the, the whole fitness culture about carbs, ketogenic, low carb diets where, yeah, that's, and, and, and they had the education size, like, you know, the guys reading forms how to like, like they're just gonna take that advice, you know, that's what I try and promote on like my page where like look you don't have to come come to me necessarily. There's loads of people out there. Seeker professionals advice, just drop someone a message and say, Look, what 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 method should I use? Or like you give me a bit of help and like I'd I'd assume the majority of people would would drop me a message back and help you out. But luckily in this area now there's there's more people like yourself that you know, qualified people who are who are giving that good advice and Potentially in five, ten years' time, there might be that low carb sitting in the sauna on a Monday night kind of thing past, might, yeah. might might be gone. Well, that's the key word you said there is qualified. Yeah. Now, qualified doesn't mean I've seen a documentary, I've seen this guy do it. I knew, yeah. no, you know what you're on about because this yeah. is where the real line is because it's yeah. health and safety. This is someone's oh, yeah. well being, and you're going to go into a fight. It's not. I make weight to then compete in a sport that isn't contact based. No, you're taking like brain damage, some serious sort of thing. It's a very oh yeah, hundred percent. Because you know we spoke off here about like people who do like you know a three day course and they're, they're suddenly a weight cut specialist. Like like I'm like it's not me blowing my own trip, but I've mm. I've got two degrees. I still don't know the whole ins and outs of it. I'm still learning as you go. But that that fundamental knowledge that I've learned from them degrees sets you in good stead. So when you are like learning more. You've got that background knowledge. Someone who's just straight off the street, boom, straight into. How can you learn about the body, the bo- total body water physiology in three days? It just doesn't like it. It blows my mind, and like it's gonna get to the point where someone unfortunately is gonna get seriously injured. You know, we've seen the stuff with like, you know, a lot of the, like the George Lockhart stuff now, where he was like the main, he was like the main nutritionist now, mm-hmm. and then he sort of there's there's a few sort of you know stories about his weight cuts and like you know you can't you can't you can't learn and things on it on, on over three days like i said that i'm i'm constantly learning you've got you've got to you've, you've got to do that and i think it's only when unfortunately when something 
bad bad will happen that there'll be some regulations. But like the thing with like to me wrapping on it, but no, in uh, in in Australia it's it's really strict. So I'm lucky where I I have to be insured. I can't call myself a nutritionist over in Australia. Well, without being registered, go through the whole mm. process and pay, you know, go through CPD courses. Okay. Otherwise, there's been instances where people have been sued for like fifty thousand dollars. But over here, it's not regulated like that, so anyone can just go boom. Yeah, I did did John's weight cut on the weekend. I'm now a specialist, and there's no there's no ramifications for that. I think as well in the Western world of the aesthetic being such a a prominent thing, yeah, people don't almost care for that validation for who's who it is is oh i need to get an answer i need to get this fixed oh mm. i'm not getting what i've got so regardless of how ridiculous some things may sound yeah you'll just take it because oh yeah. they look like that. that's what they did i'm going to follow them monkey yeah. see monkey do kind of thing yeah, yeah i think having that integrity especially albeit from a legislation point of view you had yeah. to have it you keep that ethics that i need yeah. to make sure you're safe yeah it's so important and it goes into so many different levels of things yeah 100 percent. because like i've had to on numerous occasions say a couple of weeks since fight cam go i look i think this is this is pushing the body too far. And you have to have them difficult conversations to coach and say, look, I don't think don't think they should fight. Mm. And like but like my thing is is health and safety. Like I I, I, I yeah, obviously making the weights like the bread and butter part of my job, mm. but the main part is your, your, your health and you're going home to your family at the end of the day. Like, mm. you know, what's the point in damaging a kidney, you know, damaging your brain cells for for a fight? It's just blows my mind but it's good now with like the UFC PI and the they've got a good team there and the the like the top level they can go and access access them facilities. I think there's data where since the UFC PI had opened like only ten percent or something like that had missed weight in the past couple of years in comparison to X amount mm. the years before. So I think it's just it's just a growing area and hopefully there's just gonna be more and more qualified people and the sort of like charlatans and them type of people will be sort of pushed out, but it's probably not going to happen. There's a lot of different yeah. factors, and again, yeah. we say about like charlatans, people in the sport who've got away with certain things. Yeah. There's also the element of just the aging process. That yeah. Some things work with certain metabolism, you get yeah. away with murder to an extent, and then at some point you start hitting certain walls. You're like, I yeah. need to adjust this, adjust yeah. that. And one thing we spoke about as well before we had this conversation about testing. Yeah about how it's so important to start getting these sort of metrics in to understand where the trajectory is, how you're developing to the new diets and things like that. Mm. And say from amateur up to professional, what sort of testing do you think would be a good starting point for someone who hasn't had any kind of overview of their their body and their health sort of situation? I think mainly, so the main one you want to get is a body fat assessment. So one of the main reasons, can you actually make that weight? Mm. You know, Person A who's needs to make sixty three kilos, for example, but he he's walking around at seventy one. He's got eight percent body fat in comparison to a guy's the same weight, but he's eighteen percent body fat. Mm. Who's going to make the weight a lot easier? It's going to be person B. So that's the determinant fact. Can you can you make that weight with the body fat assessment? And also with that, you get a better prediction of what your rest of metabolism is. Apart from you, you know, if you didn't do that, you'd have to use equations. Sometimes they could be two, three hundred calories off. So body fat assessment to first one and then getting some blood taken, ideally. So to assess any, if you've got any deficiencies, um, if it mentions off camera about, I was pushing to a guy who, who started working, he was always feeling tired, fatigued. I said, get some bloods done, put, put it off, put it off, put it off. And then he got his bloods done and he's iron deficient. It was like, that explains it. Yeah. So. You know, I, I understand with, you know, cost and, you know, people have got jobs and families, it is it is difficult to get, you know, a, for example, like a body fat assessment, the most accurate me method is a DEXA scan, which is a bit like an MRI machine, sorry, and that can cost up to like £100. So it is quite expensive, but then you go to like the lower end of the body fat assessment where you, know, you stand on the scales, you know, the accuracy is not 100%. Mm -hmm. But you're getting a bit of a reading, but then you 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 you're paying ten pounds to do that. So it's, it's I can understand where like the the cost side of things, but the way I look at it, like you want to take it seriously in the sport. They're the things that you need to do. You want you want to know your body, 
the ins and out of your body. Um, also, in terms of like fitness testing, so in Perth, I'm lucky to have like access to um, ECU, the uni. So one of the guys in there, Dr. Oliver Barley, is like one of the main combat sports researchers in the world. So we luckily get one of the guys in the UFC going for testing. We do VO2 max testing, wing gate testing, strength testing, and then we compare his data in comparison to the UFC data. So mm. we can compare his to all the welterweights in his division, where he, where his VO2 max is in comparison to that and get really you know say he's low in a certain category right we know we need to mm. we need to work on yeah, strength yeah. yeah but at the same time like not not everyone has access to that so yeah like but body fat and blood for the if it was for the baseline assessments you, you want to be going for long-winded answer <laughs> no, that's good that's, it's good to have a sort of detail that's yeah. half the point of this conversation yeah. and also on our last conversation we spoke about say Paddy the Baddy, his yeah. um, assessment yeah. about how we realised even with this dramatic weight cut he had, yeah. that testosterone didn't re- replenish the same kind of amount and that sort yeah. of thing is what you don't see. Yeah. And that's where the scientific approach is so important because yeah. from a superficial point of view and the fighting attitude of, you know, always put on a brave face, you know, you're going to fight, you know, yeah. hard as nails, you don't even yeah. acknowledge anything, you know, it's <laughs> held together with duct tape and you're narrowly <laughs> there but now I'm yeah. fine, I'm good yeah. to go. got another round of me coach, put me in. But then you have to appreciate what's Look, what's like looking forward? How yeah. long can you keep doing that for? What yeah. sustainable damage is it going to keep doing? Yeah. And again, on the well-being side of it, so oh, they they made the weight, but what do they have to sacrifice to get to that point in the first place? And yeah, what can you replenish it in that stage? Well, there's things where like I've worked with with guys where like they've you know Nathan, what Miami saying, worked with Nathan Bendon, and like he he did some of the worst weight cuts ever. He was mm-hmm. cutting like seven kilos in the bar, and like. His, his body was knackered from doing that and like it like it doesn't just take like one fight camp mm. to you know proper nutrition plan to get up and run again it, it can take a long time to get your body back to normal again because you're doing that losing doing big weight cuts ballooning back up mm. same again same again same again like it's just you can't you can't it's not sustainable and you know to see the things are like paddy the body like you know, he works with people and a lot cleverer than me. He works with people in the put John Moore's professors, doctors, but I can't imagine them to be sitting there going, This is this is the right way to do things, like for a sustainable career. But mm. you know, I suppose if you win a fight I, I understand if you wanna fight, you you wanna go and enjoy yourself on the big stage, like it must be amazing for him to, you know, all the exposure mm. going to it. But like I just long term it's just I, it's just not like the studies have shown yeah. it's not a good it's not a, it's not a good thing to do like you know working with jordan when we did a bit of a um a reverse diet post camp like the differences when he put a flip picture up like him a week after his, his last fight like yeah. the diff- like it's like a different person and that's just all it takes is like okay have a couple of days you know enjoying myself and then just a little bit of a structure just a, just a little bit a little bit of a structure track track your calories and then just slowly increase it and Look at the difference now. He's he, he 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 could go into a fight camp tomorrow. He's he's ready to go. Like in comparison, to like I've put on like you know eight percent body fat now and like you know fat shit. I've got to lose twenty yeah. kilos. It's like and then do it. Imagine doing that like four times a year. Just what was Jordan's cut last time for the Hugh slash Hendon camp? Because obviously Hendon stepped in last minute. Yeah, well his was so we started. He started uh, very early on, so we had about eleven weeks together. He was about seventy-seven when we started, and the, 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 like, luckily, like the more time you've got, the better. You, you know, we just gradually dropped the weight down. Like you mentioned, that it was one of the easiest cuts he had. You know, you start, I think, start a fight week around seventy, about seventy-two, something like that, and then pretty cruisy water cut, mm. and it just shows like you got time, you got enough time to design a proper fight camp plan. Just take so much pressure away, and like shit. I've got like, I've got to lose that in four weeks, you know. Um, and I was mentioned like, he's he can he can go into fight camp, but he's from doing that reverse diet, and he's ready to go into another fight camp straight away, pretty much. And from the outside looking in on seeing his camp and seeing his progression, you see yeah. the sort of his frame kept on building. He yeah. didn't seem to bloat. He seemed yeah. to lean and keep that kind of progressive. 
mm. like strength build without having to go through the sort of <laughs> the fluffy stage where you start yeah. bulking and you start cutting and the way well he, he looks he looks I see in the movie it's like he looks fucking massive mm. like he look like but like they look just big frame like mm. like like that's the first time I'd seen yeah. him since the fight it's like hey, that's big <laughs> I see. He's, the thing is, when his camp was going on, there was so much he was going on with his training wise. Yeah. Like training with Adam, like five times a week, and training with like Lucas and BST, everyone else, but all these hard sessions consistently, but keeping the same level, like regards of his, like, you know, his output, his like, well being, all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting yeah. seeing that, because obviously in a camp where you're maxing out, you're depleting yourself, all these other things, but to sustain a level of effort and output. Yeah. That's what I was impressed with the most, I think. So, yeah. in regards of the sort of camp quality, how do you find that line of output versus, you know, it's just what you signed up for, regards of being a bit depleted from a. Oh, camp. so in terms of like, you know, you, you're bound to have mm. a bit of a decline and sort yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all to do with like, I think the, the time, like, rent to the time period as well. Like, if you've got a short time period and you've got to lose it a decent amount of weight, you, you're going to. You're gonna notice them declines in the in the in the outputs and training, and then when you've got a bigger cut to do, you're tapping into your lean body mass as well, especially if you if you're pretty lean anyway. Mm. So you're gonna lose them lean body mass gains, like your, your strength can potentially go down. So I, I was I always say like the more time you got, the better to, and the post fight stuff where don't just balloon up, stay you know stay within a decent range, and then you can just. You can just go again, um, and this, this it's interesting as well because with like the scientific data, you know, it'd be interesting to see like the actual number of the power mm. outputs difference in, in 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 between each camp, like start the camp, middle camp, end the camp. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's always going to be, especially like with fight week, the last couple of weeks are always like the. the the week before fight week is always one of the toughest weeks, and you know you, you're not consuming you know as many calories as, as you'd like. So that 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 power output's likely to go down, and, and then with fight weeks, always you know you're not you never you never yeah. training as hard, but you know the, the common feedback of fight week, I, I feel pretty tired, and like yeah, you can it's understandable because you don't have any carbs, but. Um, that's what I was speaking to you off camera about getting getting equipment to really test like the different different stages of camp. You know, going in doing a VO two max mm -hmm. test with Jordan, start of camp, mid camp. You know, a couple of weeks out and just seeing the improvements or if there's anything anything that we need to change. And um, but that that's that's an area I really want to want to go go down into. Because this is where, at least from your point of view, from a a service to a customer yeah. is you have tangible evidence this is how much of a difference I've made for your performance yeah. just in these metrics alone I mean obviously you'll see it from the anecdotal sort of I feel better in this, this, this session here I feel better yeah. here I look better there but the actual numbers and seeing I'm making this sort of lean muscle growth I'm, yeah. you know your you know, like injuries little things like that pop yeah. up it's sort of, there's so many different factors to yeah. sort of involve with this one question I've got from a, a weight cutting point of view so I've heard mixed opinions on this. So yeah. if you're having to do the hot bath saunas, the hydration stage, yeah. would you rather do that in the morning of the weigh-in? So same, so the day before, so say weighing on the Friday, fight on the Saturday, yeah. would you rather do the cut on the Friday morning early and then be dehydrated more intensely but for a short period of time yeah. or the night before and sort of spread it out a bit more? So this, I, it all really depends on the size of the cup, but I typically recommend, say it's a morning weigh-in, scenario someone's I'll give Nathan for example he started his water cut at, he fights 16 and a half his water, he started his water cut at 60 around 67 so mm -hmm. I typically get him in the night before do just do one quick round 20 minutes 20 minute bath 20 minute towel wrap and then go to sleep and what happens and see what's called float so basically you you lose weight in your sleep through like breathing mm -hmm. sweating and typically, in, I've I've got data with some guys. I've lost up to like one point two kilos really? by just having a hot bath. Because you, but well, theoretically, it, it's understandable. You get having a hot bath, you get out, you go to bed. Your body temperature's naturally, you know, it's 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 increased. So you're going to be sweating more in sleep, and so then you basically it's not free weight, but you've mm. lost, you know, 
it, it ranges between like, I've had some people who've, who've lost fuck all, but then I've had people that have lost up to like one point two kilos, like one point two kilos. Then the next day you've got like one round the bath, it's done. And then people are like, I've never, I've always got it in the morning. It's like that's just a little, a little hack that you do. Um, but it's it's crazy how how it works. Like yeah, Nathan did, he did he did one point two in the bath. The this for his world title fight, one point two in the bath night before, lost eight hundred and fifty grams in his sleep, and then did less than a kilo. And it's like it's like that's the easiest thing. I've never known that was a thing to do. I just did it all in the morning. It's like mm-hmm. it just takes it like the way it looks like the path of least resistance where try and make it as easy as possible. If you can potentially lose that weight just by doing a quick bath the night before, then it's it's worth it. The general process for the saunas, hot baths and the wraps. Yeah. How do you tend to split that? Is it like an even, say, 10 minutes in there, 10 minutes there, 20, 20s? Is it just keep rolling? So, I, I, like, I try and go off, like, the research. There was a study that did uh, in Ireland. It was with grapplers, and they did 20 minutes in the bath, 40-minute towel wrap, and they repeated that twice. And they averaged around 1 point, I think it's about 1.6 kilos they lost in that time period. But then it's also working. So that's like a baseline. I try and do like 20, 30 minute bath, 30, 40 minute towel wrap. But it's all dependent on the individual as well. Like I know some guys that we'll do a bit longer in the bath. We do 40 minutes of bath and we do 20 minute towel wrap because mm. we know we can lose it. Like they lose a bit more doing it that way. So it's sort of like following the research guidelines, but then tweaking it around the individual. Um, I typically don't recommend the saunas because a couple of reasons. You can't control the temperature. You basically your whole body's just cooking. At least with the bath, yeah. you sit there, for a before, chill, put music on, someone can cool your face. The sauna, you, yeah, you just you're sitting there cooking. It's it's more more accessible. Like you've got a lot more access to a sauna than not many people have baths now. Mm. Um, but. Yeah, the saunas are like, I don't know if you've done it yourself, it's not, yeah. a, pl- it's not a pleasant process. That's right. Really. Yeah, to sit in the sauna for that long and, yeah, you just hold your whole body's, at least at the back, yeah, you can sit out, you can, you can, you can have some music on, it's a, it's a little bit more of a relaxing kind of atmosphere. Like, I, <laughs> I had an incident where, last week, I had a guy fighting in Thailand, ran through, we, we had to do the, we had to do the weight cut in the sauna, and then he messaged me saying, the sauna's closed for the night. It's not open till 12 o'clock tomorrow um, morning. And we weigh in at 10. I was like, what? So the way, the way into, I was like, so I'm thinking of like, yeah, yeah. brainstorm, like how are we gonna do this? But luckily he got that, but it's like, oh, it's like, cause the, the hotel just didn't have baths. So like, when you're, when you're away, when the fight is like in a different, not a home or they're, they're mm. competing in a hotel, most likely you're only gonna have a sauna, but, yeah, I just I'm just not a big fan of the saunas. I've so what happened in that instance then? So no baths, no sauna. How did they get that sort? <laughs> he, he got he, he he got a sauna in the end. He, no, sorry, he didn't get a sauna. In. He got he got moved to a room with a bath. But I was I was sitting there. He's like, how the fuck are you gonna get this race off? <laughs> like, and I was thinking of all the scenarios and thinking every scenario in my head was like not safe in the slightest. So then luckily, yeah, he, he got he got a bath in the end, but. This is the thing, like things like that, like it's crazy how many times like things like that can happen where someone scales a broke or the, like it's we one scale saying this, the other scale saying that, and like when cause I work remotely most of the time, mm. it's like it's quite hard to <laughs> to control that scenario. It's like yeah, it's it, it's never like. You always predict it's going to go one way, but there's always something like, always some something happens, or yeah, it, ne- it never goes like to the team most of the time. Well, it's tricky as well. See yourself being remote. A lot of these fighters, when they have to fight abroad or in a different location, yeah, yeah luxury of meal prepping and you know yeah. everything's all there, uh, just a reach sort of thing. How do you find programming for people on the go? Because all the sort of things you have to, all the pills and potions to make way. Like, Luckily. With with the but well, this is like one end of the spectrum. Um, so I, I'm in regular contact with like the head of nutrition and the USCPI. So when I've got Jake Hadley was fighting, mm. and I've got Jack, I can just drop him a message. Look, he's coming. He's coming this week to the PI. 
here's his macros, can we show and boom, we saw this nutrition all done, all the weight cut stuff, like all the rehydration, like really good to have the access to that. But then it's the other end of the spectrum where I've got someone fighting in Thailand and they haven't got a cooker in the room and they're eating out and I'm asking them, like, send me a picture of the menu and the menu just like... Yeah, sort of like... Yeah, it, yeah, it says like chicken and veg, but then they send me a picture and it's like swarmed in oil at the bottom. It's like, it's hard to determine. Um, with them sort of scenarios, you've just got to be like, you're never going to get it like absolutely bang on, but the the menu thing is just send me a picture of the menu of the hotel, of the, the food in the restaurant, sorry. And then trying to get a good idea, but it's every time someone's fighting in Thailand, I'm always like, oh, fuck's sake. Here we go again. Yeah. But like with the UFC, it's like, it's awesome. It's like, um, the guy Charles just dropped my message, Jake's landing on the fourth. Um, this is what he's been eating, this is what he likes, this likes, and they go, boom, have his meals ready for him when he arrives on the Monday. It's like... How did you get in contact with the UFC to that sort of level? I just reached out. I just reached out to him. Like, I, I'm, I always try and just, like, connect with people in the area and, and build sort of relationships. And um, it, it originally happened when one of my guys was fighting on his UFC debut. And he had he didn't have a massive cup, but it, it was bigger than usual. So I thought, like, I really want to get his UFC debut. I want to get everything on point. And then, yeah, just reached out to him on Instagram. And then he said, yeah, no worries. And then got to the point with talking, like, like in WhatsApp group now. It's, like, yeah. crazy, like, talking to people like that. It's, like, people are, like, the top of the game. And knowing that every time someone's in the UFC now, just go boom, and they can sort it out. And it's, like, that is so, so much, like, stress off the fight, off the fight as well. Because if you, like... Like with Jake, he had his debut, it's a big thing. You, you, you've got so many thoughts going on in your mind. You know that you can pick up and you've got, mm. you got your meals for the day. All your rehydration, so you don't have to think about it. Like, it's perfect. So working with Jake, obviously, for his debut, because yeah. Contender Series ended up missing weight, which yeah. you weren't working with him at that stage. Yeah. What was the biggest change you made with him to make sure he made weight this time around? I think we just, we had more time. I think if he would have, with the Contender Series, he had like three weeks to make the weight. So Jake... Walks around, you know, sort of high high sixties. So he had three weeks to get down to that weight. So it, it was difficult, and he wasn't working with anybody. So I can, in a way, understand why he, why he missed weight. But this time we had, well, he pulled. He originally had this fight in, was it March, and then he had an injury, mm -hmm. and then so we've had a bit of like a, a staggered camp. So we've been able to be in co regular contact with him for. It's like three months now, so he's had. It's just the time as mentioned before. Like he just had a good amount of time mm. to to get that weight down, and you know, working with a meal prep company as well and sorting the meals out. Um, yeah, and he, it was it was it was a good wake up for him, and yeah, I think it's just it's just it's just like getting enough time to get that weight down in three weeks to cut. You know, especially the lighter, mm. it's about the lighter guys. You know, it's 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 a, it's a lot. And um, but yeah, um, I think I think for like future camps, we like it's good to get like dates as well. Though, like we know we can sit around here, this fight camp, and then hopefully he's going to be fighting again in the next couple of months, which would be pretty cool to see. No, oh, fantastic. I'd say with these sort of like the rehydration stages and the um, reverse diet, as like you said earlier about yeah. trying to keep that sustainable amount, but also like the happy medium between your norm versus you know being a bit stricter, getting these rough outlines, yeah. getting a bit progressively more um, strict, more refined. But one thing that would be interesting thought is, that, do you change your process to regard their weight division? So say the smaller guys, the bigger guys, you've changed a lot of the way you plan out their meals. Yeah, well, it's it's naturally the, the, the amount of calories needed mm. for, you know, a welterweight to maintain lose weight is, is, is naturally going to be less than, you know, a flyweight to the rest of metabolism. So, and also in terms of like, with the with the water cut, you don't like I, I have like a traffic light system. It sounds a bit corny, but I have like a traffic light system where like my weight cuts are like, you know, one to three percent. We say that's pretty, that's pretty good because mm. one to three percent your body weight, you could have a hard sparring session and you could comfortably lose one to two kilos. Mm. That's that. So like, that is like that's good. And then like an amber is like four to six. Where it's like mm. we are we're pushing the body a little bit, but it's still within that range mm. where we're okay. And then when it gets to like you know six percent plus, that's when like we're really we're really pushing the body now. We're sort of, I'll, I'll actually I'll backtrack on that so to, to to explain it properly. 
try to, I try and explain like the body, total body water in like three different compartments. So you have your intracellular fluid, which is fluid in between, uh, fluid in your cells, like your brain cells, kidney cells, muscle, and then the extracellular fluid, which is fluid in between them cells, and then um, fluid in the blood and the plasma. So when you when you lose body water, you're sweating, you, you, you start taking water from the plasma, from the blood. So that one to two percent coming from the blood. But the more dehydrated you get, the more it starts pulling water from them cells. And you know, as the more dehydrated mm. you get, you're pulling water from you know, kidney cells, brain cells, and then that's when you talk about when guys have had big water cuts and they're prone to be knocked out because mm. the, the, the pretty much the brain's like dehydrated. So with the the smaller guys, you don't really want to be put. You don't really you want to be going into like lower range. But with bigger guys, you can potentially go like the like the four to six percent is like that's that's pretty comfortable. But yeah, it's um that's a, like it's it's a pretty sim like generic kind of guide that I follow. But it's a good way to sort of work out how the the, the body works. Mm -hmm. Trying to break it down to someone who doesn't know it. No, definitely, it's an interesting way of understanding this all. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to sort of get into is obviously younger athletes. Yeah. Because weight cut, especially with boxing and things, you see kids competing all the time, and their weights are just as you know strict as everyone else. You have to be their category, you know, as is. Yeah. How do you find dealing with younger athletes? Yeah, I think the main thing with with young ones, it's just educating them on the fundamentals, like you know, getting enough protein in, having carbs around training, having carbs for recovery, having a decent amount of fat. Getting you sleeping, hydrate, mm -hmm. hydrating, you know, keeping hydrated throughout the day. Sorry, I think they're the main ones. You want like the younger one. You don't really want to be got right that breaking down. This is you yeah. know, water cuts and stuff like that. It's 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 just getting the fundamentals right, and then you know as they progress through the career, you know, they are likely to have to do some form of of cut. But surprisingly, I don't actually work with that many like really young. Fighters, um, but the ones I've done it, ones I have worked with, it's 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 just getting that, then fundamentals like make sure you, you feel for training, you having you know the recommended carbohydrates, you you're keeping your protein intake high, you know having fats hydrated and stuff like that. No, definitely, and this is where it's a very important thing to understand for a lot of people listening because. Yeah. You see Darren Till doing his cut, you see Conor McGregor doing cut, all these other things. You yeah. think that is just cutting yeah that is universal that yeah. is one size fits all and that's yeah. a very very dangerous game to play especially without any sort of prior education or understanding yeah. of the risk involved this is why i think this conversation is very important for yeah. different reasons and mainly so to understand the damage you don't know you're doing yeah but superficially you look a bit skinny that's about it, but you don't appreciate what's actually happened yeah well there's been instances i've, I've lived in australia for five years now so the i think the year before i the year i came there was a girl who was 17 and she was fighting in Thailand and she got told to run the sweatsuit and mm. she got found dead on the roads. Like, and this is like a 17 year old cutting, like, I think she had to cut like three kilos, like 17. That's like, that's crazy. Like, who, who like, who told her to do that? Mm. It's like, that's like a normal thing to do. And, you know, they shouldn't be doing stuff like that. Like, typically, like, yeah, even well. like, even like, like, amateurs really shouldn't. Be cutting massive, ma massive amount of weight. It should be their priority. Should be getting the skills up, you know, getting a good body comp, and then you know, progressing up, progressing the careers if they want to go professional. Not cutting massive amounts of weight. Um, that's my opinion. And like, with someone who's young, and mm. you know, that that's that's the main focus. But I think that's like the thing in, with weight cutting in general. People are so focused on like losing the weight, losing the weight, losing the weight, losing the weight. But they completely forget that they compete mm. the next day. That's that's the main that's the main thing that you need to do. Like you you're fighting. You're not you're not getting paid to lose yeah. to make the weight. And it's like you know, people I spoke about before. Like people think it's like a like a badge of honor. Oh yeah, I've done that. Yeah, and I think it's gonna take a while for that for that process to to change. You know, maybe in the future they might the, the USC might. Change the way the, the weight cut rules. Like, you know, we see one championship, mm -hmm. the hydration testing, and um, but I think that them sort of things will only happen when unfortunately something bad happens. 
when they feel like they have, they'll have to do that. Yeah, and this is where I think the nature of fighter pay, the other things come back into conversation because where's yeah. the budget for that? Because yeah. the budget for paying the fight in the first place yeah. isn't there or isn't claimed to be there. But, oh, look, where's all this testing come from? Where's that? Yeah. <laughs> where's that come from? It keeps an escalating. Yeah. Say, there's a lot of should be doing this, should be doing that. And I think something you're doing now regards of just educating from a grassroots level of yeah. <laughs> don't jump in the sauna, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put down the Kit Kat and let's have a conversation and <laughs> have a chat. No, it's yeah, very important. In the sauna with a kick out. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, if I keep sweating, I'll keep going. Yeah. I'll break even. No, I keep smelting. Oh, shit, you hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> it just gives a bit of a loop. And one thing the sauna mentioned as well, we're talking yeah. about different ways of conditioning the body for get acclimatized to the heat. There's something I mentioned beforehand about, sorry, what was it again? Heat, heat, heat acclimation. Mm. So it's like, I, I think for, in terms of helping with the water, I think it can help like, so much it basically it's it's acclimatizing to the heat so for example in, in a colder climate like the uk you need to do a water cut in the middle of winter you sit in the bath it's going to take you a while to start sweating because you, you're not you're not used to that heat exposure basically the heat acclimation is just regular exposure to the heat so it increases your sweat rate it dilutes your sweat so basically when you sweat you lose electrolytes your sodium potassium magnesium so when you do regular exposures heat you don't lose as much electrolytes and then your core temperature and when sweating is initiated is lower so it doesn't take you that long to basically heat up mm. so you could sit in the bath you know middle of winter I haven't been I haven't been away to you know went to Spain six months early so you haven't had any any sun or any heat sorry so it's gonna you're sitting there. It's it's gonna take a while for your core temperature to to increase. So when you're doing them heat exposure, it basically it, it quickens up the process. You, you you sweat you increase your sweat weight. So it's just some, something simple as going in the sauna a couple of times a week. Just sit in the sauna, have you know a bottle of water, electrolytes, and just sit there for 20, 30 minutes. Increase it over you know the more you do it. Push it to thirty minutes. Push it to forty minutes. Do an hour. Even sit. Even sitting in the bath as well. And the differences I've seen from guys doing that has been like unbelievable. Like going from like barely losing a kilo in thirty minutes to doing two kilos in twenty minutes. Like um, like unbelievable. And something that's mm. like no no science. Like no little hack. No magic supplement. Just sit in the sauna a couple of days a week. Like it's, it's it's like you're like what do we need to do this sit and so on make sure like the important thing like you got to distinguish it it's not it's not it's not water cut it's basically treat as a training session so I say to my guys weigh yourself before you go in weigh yourself after whatever you've lost place it one point five so you've lost a kilo drink one point five liters of fluid add electrolytes in it just to replace them electrolyte losses when you loosen sweat and then. Um, yeah, it's it's literally. I think I wouldn't say it's a game changer. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's 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 a game changer in terms of the the weight cutting process. There's certainly a fact that's not been addressed at all when it comes to the process yeah. of. Well, in these sort of sports, it's very <laughs> high sweat sports. You're always yeah. soaking wet, but having that element they said about diluting the sweat. Yeah. Because that might be something people don't realize they're doing. I didn't yeah. realize that was a, a factor in it at all. Yeah. That you may be depleting yourself and hindering your performance, having not. Been well, acclimatized. well, also as well, you do that water cutting and you're not acclimatized. You're going to lose more electrolytes, which means you're going to need you're mm. going to need more electrolytes post weighing, which you're not really going to know without sort of testing. But you to to be off to be optimal, you need more electrolytes, so you need less aggressive rehydration strategy. Um, yeah, it's just it's 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 crazy. How, like when you people try and make science and all this thing really complicated and just something simple as just sit in the basket you can get thermometers from ebay you can get like 10 for like 10 pounds put the bath on around 38 to 42 degrees have a kettle next year top it up it goes down to sit in the bath for 30 minutes put the music on you're comfy put a bit of phil collins on some jellies and just, yeah, just chill out make a night of it yeah just make a night of it put some candles around it's yeah it's uh, it's just like, and it's relax and it's relaxing as well. It's like it's not you know the, as we mentioned about the sauna. Mm -hmm. It's like 
I I pit like from my own experience. I I'm not a big fan of sitting in the sun for ages, but like do the sun as well, like around seventy to ninety degrees. But a lot of times the saunas don't have the the temperature on there. But um, yeah, it's just it's 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 so simple and um, doing it two three times a week. And then if you did that for eight weeks, you can. I, I guarantee you, your listeners, if you did it, you'd notice a massive difference. There, there's a challenge for everyone there to make sure they difference. give it a go and say they're yeah. gone. But no, thank you for your time, yeah. my friend. Um, no regards of your seminars and getting in contact with you, how can people find you? Um, main thing is just Instagram, Condition Nutrition. Um, I think I'm the first person that pop up if you type in there. And then yeah, if you need any, any advice, just drop me a message. I'm always active. And yeah. He's got the uh, Superman on, he's got the uh, Nutrition <laughs> team on. Sure to check out our sponsors, English Hypnotist. So when it comes to mental side of fighting competitions, it's so important to make sure you get that absolutely nailed on. Richard Hart's fantastic. He supports the podcast. And thank you so much to Stuart and Nigel at Purple Media and Chapel Play Studios for making this podcast happen. There's no word to how much I appreciate what these guys do for me. It's beyond amazing. But thank you for your time, my friend. No worries, mate. Pleasure. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. You too.